This episode contains adult language, drinking, fighting, loud noises, discussion though not depiction of gore, and brief prison scenes. Arden is brought to you as always by Wayface Industries, the people. So, previously on Arden, meet intrepid radio journalist Bea Casely. This isn't an investigation, it's journalism. A little while back, Bea found herself with the chance to make her dream show, a true crime podcast dissecting the 2007 disappearance of Hollywood superstar Julie Capsum and her one-time boyfriend, Ralph Montgomery. I think girls my age need to stand up and speak out, and that's what Jane Austen Fight Club is all about. There was just one problem. They want excitement, action, suspense. They want results. Detective Brenda Bentley crashed the party, and B and Brenda like to argue. You've got another thing coming. You know, I think it's you've got another thing coming. Just tell me what your evidence is. And it's think. In their search for Julie, the two were joined by the world's greatest assistant, Rosalind Esler. That's me. And hyper-competent producer, Pamela Pink. Thank you. Please don't editorialize. And they also got to contemplate the ravages of late-stage capitalism with eccentric billionaire Andy Wayface, the owner of both Brenda's detective agency and Bia's radio station. Explain how I bought out the station to make sure Bia and Brenda... Oh, I'm just doing the bare minimum, Mr. Wayface, like you asked. Hmm. Oh, explain how we're both airline pilots. That could be important. Hmm. Anyway... Every step B and Brenda got closer to the truth, more complications arose, almost as if there was an elaborate conspiracy to hide the truth. Because there was. We got through everything else. But there's something about this one, it just... It pings me. Julie and Ralph were alive and living in Verona, Italy. And once Team Arden found them, everything fell apart. So, this stupid thing I did as a teenager, it's given me everything. But my choices also destroyed everything. Brenda gave up the show, possibly because of how close Bia was getting to Lorena Christopher, fellow podcast host. I didn't get a chance to say this to you on the show, but I am so proud of you. Julie went to jail, Arden became a hit, And Brenda's still missing over a year later. It's all a collection of things that don't seem like they matter until they do. You can lose a forest, but you can't lose a tree. You gotta cut that motherfucker down. If you want to know anything more, listen to season one. There's a torso in a trunk. Tell them how I finally won the endless struggle with the self. Oh, that didn't make the final edit. Editors deemed it unnoteworthy. Sorry. But if it didn't make the final edit, did it even happen? I mean, if you have fond memories of it... It's only canon if it makes the final edit! Damn it! You win again, you! I'm so fucking sick of these two Andys. Anyway, I have a treat for our listeners to kick off season two. During season one... I logged all of Bia's original case notes, and I found some fascinating audio of Bia and Brenda getting drinks in 2008. Don't go getting any ideas. Once Upon a Time on Arden. Is that thing on? I just said, do you mind if I record this? And you said, sure. So I thought that... I (laughs) I also saw you press the record button. I'm not an idiot. Right. So, I'm meeting with Detective Brenda Bentley, who's in full uniform. A nice touch. Ooh, Casely loves the uniform. (laughs) We're here to discuss the Julie Capsum case. It's January 1st, 2008, and we're in the Double A Steakhouse and Bar of Eureka, California. Do you always announce where you are? As radio is a purely auditory medium, it's impossible for the listener to know. I get it. And if you get too sozzled, you want to know where to find the best beers and steaks in all of Eureka. I'm not drinking. Notice the water? That's not vodka. 
I don't put ice in my vodka. Jeez, too fancy for our townie ways. I see. No, I love townies. I mean, just tell me how the investigation is going. Come on, Casely. You can call me Bia. Not if you call me Bentley. Fair. Just get a drink with me. It's the worst that could happen. It's ridiculous. Absurd, even. But what if Julie was hiding clues to her eventual disappearance in plain sight? Yeah. We run into that a lot in missing person cases. You do? No, Casely. You know, I bet you have great stories. Oh, I do. I'd love to hear them sometime. Not like that. Not like that. Okay, you shot down all of my theories. What's yours? I don't like to theorize. Bullshit. I never met a cop who didn't like to theorize just a little bit. How many cops have you met? A few. One or two. You're a cop. (laughs) Look, let me tell you how this is going to go. We're going to find a body. Probably up in the woods somewhere. Probably a few years from now. And you'll never know. You'll never understand why this happened. Because even if you could sit across from Julie Capsum and ask her, she wouldn't tell you. You can't answer things like this. You just can't. There's truth, though. Objective truth. You can find out what happened. Yeah, what happened... But you can never really find out why. I don't know about that. The truth is more than knowing what happened, Casely. And it always runs away from you. In the end. Maybe. Sure. I should not have had so much vodka. Woo! I forget you're just a kid sometimes. I'm barely five years younger than you. I'm not talking about how old you are. Look. You still haven't told me your theory. I know you have one. It's unprofessional to... Come on. Come on. Please. I shared all my stupid ideas with you. (laughs) Like the hidden messages in Jane Austen Fight Club? If you play that movie backwards while listening to Now That's What I Call Music 15... We already went over that. All right. All right. I have one theory I really like. It's a little unconventional, but... So. Middle of the night. Middle of nowhere. Like she was just... Lifted. Up into the sky, right? I'm thinking it was definitely... An alien... Like little green men. Big-eyed freaks. Aliens. <laughs> I was I was just kidding around. No, you weren't. Look, look, look take, take that off the record. Uh, that's not how this works. You can't say something on the record, then take it off. I'm not too drunk to forget that. Fine. Listen. Take it off the record and I'll... I'll make it up to you. How? No one will ever hear this. You can't know that. If people hear me talking about aliens, they'll think I'm a joke. Casely, you can't. You can't make me a joke. Now, what's this look like to you? That's a bear. I know bears. That's a bear. Right. And yet, Brenda Bentley, the uh, genius detective who helped find Julie Capsum, writes on her Instagram, finally, a missing link, the mighty skunk ape. I wish I got that excited every time I saw a bear.
Tuesday? Then it's time for Laughing on a Tuesday Live. And now it's everybody's favorite podcast, Arden. We join Bea Casely in the process of solving a mystery. We've almost found her. We've almost found Julie Capsum. No, <laughs> hold the phone. What about aliens? I found this weird green blood. That's guacamole. It was taken away from you, though. Well, and I... And no one's seen Brenda Bentley outside of the now infamous skunk ape Instagram post. I know what you're doing here. You want me to speak ill of my co-host. But I'm here to talk to you about season two. Let me tell you about Dana, an amazing young woman who No, no, on- no. Let's talk about this, Bia. A co-host wouldn't leave you high and dry, would she? Next on The Costume Comedian, he came all the way from the afterlife. See if you can figure out the identity of... The Ghostly Giraffe. Hello, 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 and boo. It is I, the Ghostly Giraffe, the funniest and spookiest ungulate in show business. Now, a joke. A priest, a college student, and a politician are in an airplane when the engines give out. But there are only two parachutes. The politician says, the world needs me. He grabs a parachute and leaps from the plane. The priest turns to the student and says, I've lived a long and fulfilling life. Take the parachute. But the student says, no worries, father. It's a Wayface Industries brand parachute and can easily support up to six people. (laughs) Up to six people. Ooh, I know that voice. I think it's Bill Gates. Kinley's assassin is as good as caught. Now, <laughs> hold the phone. What about the skunk ape? And the party goes to... B. Casely, host of Arden! <laughs> Thank you for this considerable honor. Though I dispute our classification as a comedy, uh, there are so many people I couldn't have done this without. My producer, Pamela Payne, Andy Wayface, the guy who signs my checks. Literally, he signs all the checks. Um, Rosalind, the greatest assistant alive. And I have to thank my partner, The woman who stole my heart. The one, the only, Lorena Christopher. You've shown me what love is, baby. (laughs) I'd say it's time to find out who the ghostly giraffe is, but I think we already know. Oh, ho! But you do not, for I am not Sir Tom Hanks. Come on, man. You're Andy Wayface. How did you know? It's such a pleasure to have you here. Now, did you bump into any skunk apes backstage? (laughs) No, no, I think that's Brenda's department. Now, where is she? She'll be back for season two as we head to Montana to examine another twisty mystery. Maybe the mystery should be where Brenda Bentley is. (laughs) Yeah, you could hire the skunk ape to find her. He seems dependable. is the Zodiac Killer. I just have to open and... Now, ho, 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 the phone! All right, we're recording Arden Season 2 intro, take one. We're recording? 
The light's not on. Yeah, Dr. LaRoe broke the light. Then how do I know I'm recording? You're just going to have to trust me. And trust me, you're recording. (sighs) Eight years ago... Hold on. Okay. Yep. You're not recording. And... Okay, now you are. I'm not in the zone anymore. (sighs) Okay. Imagine yourself trying to get a small child to sleep by reading a list of ingredients on a cereal box. Congrats, you're in the zone. Go. Wow, thanks. That did the trick. Eight years ago, Dan Hamill was found dead on his ranch, Hamill Hills. His death rocked his small town of Elsinore, Montana. His daughter Dana has tried to keep his memory and his ranch alive. But every day, the ranch gets closer to being sucked up by corporate vampires. Could one death be emblematic of the death of the entire American dream? Boo! Excuse me? Okay, no booing when the recording light is on or... You know, when we all know that it would be if it were functional. Oh, I get it. She's doing what Brenda would do if she were here. It's conflict. I love it. Brenda would never boo me in the middle of a take. Okay, take two. Eight years ago... I'm going to boo you again if you make this show's introduction about your hard-on for the death of rural America or whatever you've got in mind. It's my show, actually? It's all of our show. Though legally, I do own 84% of it. What about the other 16%? I lost it to Miss Pink in a game of crabs. Crabs? He's talking about playing craps, but where you throw live crabs instead. Can we please get back to the introduction? They kept crawling off the table. Does Auntie have an underwater casino? Oh, crabs, go on land, Bea. Free your mind. But yes, this happened at the underwater casino. Okay, as the 16% owner of Arden, I demand you all stop talking, okay? Except for Bia, who will talk exactly the right amount of time to record the season introduction for season two. But, but, but... No. But, 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 no. We, we've got to rewrite it. I mean, there was a murder. A super gruesome, super weird murder. One that the cops refused to investigate. I mean, there's a meticulously preserved crime scene at Dana. She's so interesting. And I just... Yes, yes, a gruesome murder. Scalps flying off heads and all that. But what's compelling here is Dana and the way she symbolizes the systematic failing of the working class. A man was literally torn to shreds. That happens on ranches. You just don't want to go to Montana. City girl can't hack it in the middle states. Oh, you didn't know? Bia's from Boston! But there were farms in Massachusetts, mostly for apples. Fascinating. I thought New York did apples and Boston did beans. Tell me more. Okay, everybody out. The booth is talent only. I want a rematch on that crabs game. Tomorrow night, high tide. Okay, Bia, you've got this. Eight years ago, Dan Hamill was torn to bloody bits in... No, no. That's too much for an opening. Um... Eight years ago, in small-town America, a wealthy rancher died. His brother took over after marrying the rancher's widowed wife and the town-wide scandal. Do I want to bring that in? Wow, I really thought that document that you brought in was prepared copy. Yeah, I wrote 50 of these. Like... 50 or... I couldn't pick an angle. It's not like Julie where everyone knows what happened. And I want this to be good. No, no, no. Not just good. Beautiful. It's what Dana deserves. Oh, for Pete, Bia, get over yourself. We've got a horrific death and a family of wackadoo rich people. It'll be good. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, let's go again. What would you do if you found your father dead in a grain auger? What if your uncle married your mom? Would you call an investigative cold case podcast? Find out on season two of Arden. That felt good. What do you think? I think I should just write the intro like I did in season one. Are you sure? I mean, I can help you with any. Oh, I've got to take this. Hi, Lorena. Yeah, babe? (laughs) That last tag had potential. That's quite a glare you're giving me. I wonder if I could weaponize it. The season was supposed to be smoother. It was supposed to be better. It was supposed to have less... Pamela, can you fix this? God, but look at this mess. Bia is falling apart without someone to balance her out. I agree that the Arden brand requires a co-host. Crime 
and banter. That's the Arden guarantee. And yet every time I give you a list of qualified candidates... You're still sore about this? I told you six months ago I was in the... I know. I read about it six months ago. But guess what? All of the candidates I had for you then, well, they got hosting jobs elsewhere because they're good at this. Now, I had a new list for you three months ago. I was in. Then one month ago. Well, that time I was visiting the moon mines. You can't take a phone call at the moon mines? Only on the surface. We needed to find another co-host then, not after we've started recording. We already have a co-host. Do you think Brenda is coming back? She's never let me down. You heard her in that Remembering Forgotten Memories clip. She said she didn't want to do this anymore. The heat of the moment. Have you heard from her? No, nothing. Maybe she took some lessons from Julie in how to disappear. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no, oh, no. My friend. Look, we have to assume she's not coming back. Normally I'd hire Brenda to solve this, but I can't hire Brenda to find Brenda. Do I hire another P.I.? Do I know another P.I.? Who P.I.'s the P.I.? Look, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole. Just breathe. Do we need to push back production? Except for Bentley, we're all ready to go. We've got all the space rented for the production team up in Elsinore. We've got the studio... Everyone has been rearranging their lives so they can head up there for the next few months. I mean, Rosalind basically lives there already. By God, that's it! What? Oh, oh, oh. Of course! It was staring us right in the face the whole time. You heard her booing. That's chemistry. I mean, she knows the show better than anyone. We might as well give it a shot. Excellent! Rosalind, Rosalind, do you have a second? I've got... A notion. It's a disaster. Worse, it's a debacle. A debacle? Well, we can't have that. I swear to God the show is cursed. Or haunted. Nothing goes right. I told you that whole neighborhood is plagued by the spirit of the notorious vaudeville comedian Harry Half. I told Andy. He had an exorcism done. I won't be surprised by any ghosts with a hat for a foot. Look, in the early 20th century, it was considered the height of comedy to put a hat on your foot and... It was a different time. We'll leave it at that. God, I could listen to you explain outdated forms of comedy all day long. And all night, too. Why don't you just leave work right now? Come over. I'll show you what I can do with a hat and a foot. (laughs) And then I'll take you out on the town, show you off before I have to relinquish you to Montana for the next few months. Oh. Can we go to that one place you took me? The Italian one? Olive Garden? Yes, I loved it. So authentic. Mm. We'll go on a tour of Italy together, and then we'll go back to my place and tour of Italy are... You know, okay, that one just didn't quite work out, but... God, I'm going to miss you. Look, come to Montana, okay? Don't you want to get away from the city? The smog and the traffic and the ghosts of hat-footed vaudevillians? I don't think I can produce a show from Montana. It's just you doing a spooky voice. It's not just me doing a... A sexy spooky voice. I just mean you can record that anywhere. It's not spooky. It's mysterious. God, I'm sorry. I sound like such a jerk. I just miss you already. I'll come and visit often, but my life is here. In hours someday. I promise you I know that. I just think, if the season is good, if we can really tell Dana's story and tell it well, I just want to be proud of it, you know? And it's all on me now. In a way I thought I wanted, but... I get it, sweetheart. Really. I just keep thinking the door will open and Brenda will breeze in wearing a... Bad hair, don't care t-shirt and start bellowing about the skunk ape spy network. It's a lot without her helping you. And I know you don't want to go to Montana. Montana? There's nothing the matter with... Oh, I thought that you were... Uh, Oh, it's not a big deal. Montana is great. Montana is fine. Oh, I must have misunderstood. I've been working since Santa Fe. Nonstop. Covering for an absent co-host in a whole studio where... Only Pamela and I know what we're doing. 
Rosalind seems capable. Oh, she is. She is. Especially at Foley effects. And drumming. I just need a break. Hopefully not from me. Not from you. From... Read it. I'm not... I'm... It'll be fun. Sounds like everyone needs a way face break. Yay. In a world where crime abounds, and true crime abounds even more. A world where good people like you go to bed in fear, wondering if you're going to become the truest crime of them all. One show is going to make the difference. To solve the crime. To make you laugh. To make you cry. To make you think. To make you juggle. Unless you're already juggling. Welcome to the new, improved Arden. Meet Bea Casely. You can't stop me from finding the truth. The reporter who won't stop digging. Whether it's a metaphorical hole to find the truth or an actual hole. Why did you give me a shovel? They can't see me. Say the line. I have a shovel and I'm not afraid to use it. Meet Rosalind Ursula. I'm gonna get to the bottom of this whether you like it or not. The intern slash assistant slash pilot slash good lord you have a lot of jobs. A girl's gotta pay her rent. I thought you lived in the janitor's closet. And you would not believe what I'm paying for it. Together, they're going to look into cases that really matter. And I say to you, Senator, that it is you who are the corrupt crumbum. By Jove, you're right. I am the corrupt crumbum. How do you know? With teamwork, good detecting, and banter. That's the Arden way. With crime, comedy, and romance? No! They're not going to stop no matter who gets in their way. Hands up, you dames. You ain't gonna solve these cases. Your fighting skills are as poor as your grammar. hi yuck! Swing the shovel. They can't see it. This season, join host Beer and Roslyn as they journey to the far-off lands of Montana, where a grievous crime has been committed and... Um, Andy? Yes? Are we sure this is the right approach? It's exciting. Action-packed. Okay, you're the boss. Oh, sorry, I gotta take this. Oh, look out, you've still got to shovel over your... I'm not paying for that. Arden Season 2. You're listening to it right now. Brought to you by Wayface Industries, the crime-solving good people. Hey Arden fans, this is co-creator Emily Vanderwerf, and I'm here to tell you about the new audio sitcom Next Stop from our friends at Multitude. Next Stop is created by Eric Silver, and it's about being in your mid to late 20s when everyone is changing around you and you worry that you might not catch up. Very Rosalind Ursula vibe, if you will. So this is about longtime roommates Cam and Allie, and they're searching for someone to replace their newly engaged former roommate. That's when they meet the ridiculous Samuel Clemens, and everything gets just a little bit weirder. Across its 10-episode first season, Next Stop follows these characters through work and relationships and friendships and more. And if you like Arden, if you like our sense of humor, I think you're also going to like Next Stop. I've listened to the full 10-episode first season, which is all available right now, and I laughed, laughed, laughed. It's so funny. Anyway, you can find the first season of Next Stop, all 10 episodes, on all podcast platforms. Start from episode one, though, because you want to make sure you listen to the story in full. That's Next Stop from Multitude on all podcast platforms. Rosalind? Yeah, boss. You don't need to call me boss. Oh, habit from what waitressing days. Touristy dads love it. Do you want to host the show? Well, sure. I mean, the public adores me. I adore avenging past wrongs via detective work. I mean, a real love fest all around. And you understand the show is real journalism, not just one of your gigs? Oh, come on. I think it'll be fun. I mean, I have more experience than Brenda did. I just worry about your focus. You're still working cases for Arden Detective Agency and searching for Brenda. 
Feels like your heart is in detective work. I'm in my early 20s. Let's not go committing my heart to anything. Plus, someone has to make sure the audience doesn't fall asleep during your soothing exposition monologues. And plus, I've already done all the background research for this season and formed relationships with the family, and you made me a reporter. Junior I- reporter? I already cut this introduction to Dana together. Just listen to it. This is Dana Hamill. So over there is where the old house used to be. My grandparents still lived there right up until they died. My dad built that house, and I have so many memories. To see her, you'd think she was any other 29-year-old former rodeo queen. When she was 17, she could ride a bucking bronco longer than any other woman from Montana. Now, she works on her family ranch. She cares for the cattle. She's a crack shot. But Dana has unfinished business. So, right before Easter 2011, I'm up at college. I get this phone call from my dad. He's all excited to see me and talking up a storm. I have a few more things I need to do in Bozeman before I can come back home, but I tell him I love him and how much I can't wait to see him. That was the last time I ever talked to him. The police say Dan Hamill died in an unfortunate farming accident. That's not uncommon around these parts, but Dana doesn't believe that. They came out and took one look at the place where he died and closed the case right then and there. They just didn't care. But I know he was killed. He was murdered. Somebody, somebody did this to him. And what would you say to that person? <laughs> what, what, what can you say to somebody like that? You monster. He was my dad. I, I wouldn't say anything. I'd, I'd just look him dead in the eye. Let him see what he took from me. It's not about what I need or want to say. It's about answers. That would be enough. Okay, yeah, that was good. I just worry. Oh my god, do you not want to host this season? I do! I've been working really hard on your brand, which I respect. I mean, it's all about the hustle. Don't say hustle like this is a movie about hard knock dance crews. Oh, hey, I, I was in a hard knock dance crew. The year was 2008. I was inspired by the children's novel, The Boxcar How Children. I'm not surprised. The point is, I'm not trying to steal your spotlight, or your variety interviews, or your L.A. Magazine Queer Podcaster of the Year Award. I I lost that to Mr. Murder Man and Mr. Mr. Murder Man. Ooh, those sellouts? I know! I I just want to catch Dan Hamill's killer and get paid. The fame is all you, boss. Do you view me as a touristy dad? Very much, yes. You had me make your reservations for the Olive Garden tonight. Have you been? They just give you breadsticks. When I went to Italy, they charged me for breadsticks every time. And I hated it. Okay, so now the recording light won't turn off. But don't assume you're always being recorded. Except we are. I mean, don't assume the microphones in front of you are actually picking you up. But, of course, please assume that the legion of tiny microphones hidden throughout the building that never turn off are recording you. If you're just joining us this season, everybody involved in Arden is under constant surveillance. (sighs) Yes, yes, the panopticon, the panopticon. Can we all just shut up about the panopticon? Uh, Pamela, did you write the intro for me? Pamela, they're asking you to fix things just like you predicted. Mm -hmm. It's a sheet of paper on the table, the one that says Arden intro. Okay, yeah, this could work. As co-host, you want me to take a crack at reading it? You're the co-host? I'm the host. Oh, I was unaware of the distinction. You can't just jump right to host. (laughs) First, you have to prove you won't make amateur mistakes. On Good Friday... Nope, we're not recording yet. But the light's on. You know, we just talked about this, didn't we? I'm nodding vigorously. Don't think knowing you have to narrate your actions makes you a podcast pro. I'm continuing to nod vigorously so that the listeners at home can follow along. Okay, we're set. Take whatever this is. 
On Good Friday, 2011, for those of you who aren't aware, Good Friday is the Christian observation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I realize the Christian church's stranglehold on our culture has waned, but I think people know what Good Friday is. People know what Easter is because there's candy for it. So maybe... Two days before Easter Sunday, 2011. Will you just stop? This is great, folks. Keep it coming. (sighs) Two days before Easter Sunday, 2011, Dan Hamill stepped into a grain bin to fix a mechanical error. He would never step out again. He was caught... Pushed! It was no accident. We don't know that yet. We wouldn't make the show if we didn't think it was a murder. Well, we can't say that. Wayface Lego said so. Well, I'll allow it, but only for my old pal Pamela. (laughs) Or should I say, my old pal... Palmela. <laughs> yeah, Wayface Legal also asked that you never say that again. He was caught in the blade of an auger, which dragged him down, breaking his limbs, breaking his back, and ultimately tearing him to shreds. He left behind a daughter who's still searching for answers. We should say Dana's name. You think? But nobody knows who she is. So? She's the one people will connect with. She was wronged over and over and over again. I and- get that you've been researching this for the past ten months or whatever. Yes. Yes, I have. And we should just mention Dana's name. It's all. It's her story. (laughs) I mean, really, the story of Arden is the story of the investigation. Okay, it's everyone's story. We are all important. Can I please just get a take of this fucking introductory monologue, please? He left behind a daughter who's still searching for answers. And the more she searches... The more Dana... Will you let me do my job? That's it. Nope. I've had enough banter. Everyone out. Rosalind out, Andy out. And Janitor Yorick, you are definitely out. Out! No one respects my creative vision. Now, Bia, from the top. So when the recording light is on, it means that I should... This podcast is cursed. God, it has to be. Have you seen Hatfoot Harry? Hat from the top. Okay, okay. On Good Friday... Jesus Christ! Literally, in this case. This instrument board. God, okay, finally, finally, we're good. We're recording. Okay, now, now, from the top. On Good Friday, 2011, Dan Hamill stepped into a grain bin to fix a mechanical error. He would never step out again. He was caught in the blade of an auger, which dragged him down, breaking his limbs, breaking his back, and ultimately tearing him to shreds. He left behind a daughter who's still searching for answers. And the more she looks into the case... Okay, I'm going to stop you there. That was that was a good start. A good start. It was a little dire. Could be more inviting. Just more energy. Yeah. Okay, I look, I know this isn't Julie. You don't have to connect to it. And I know Montana... It's not about that. Okay, sure. But Bia, you can't just melt down like this on day one. This isn't me melting down. Sure, let's just go from the top. On Groot Friday... Okay, you said Groot. Which should be a word, but regrettably isn't. I did not. On Groot Friday. (sighs) Okay, whoa. Okay. Uh, From the top. On Groot. God damn it. Okay. On Good Fly Day. I said Fly Day, didn't I? Yep, but we are going to just push through this. So just keep that energy up. On Groot Fly Day. Okay, just (laughs) two, two days before Easter. Just... Say that. Okay, okay. Two days before Easter Sunday, 2001. God damn it! Okay, not 2001. I know this. I do. I, I swear God damn it. Do you need a break? I don't need a break! I don't need to leave the studio, and I don't need... Bia. This show's a disaster already, and it's my fault. I'll admit you struggling to pronounce the word good is a new one, but... No, no. We know this show doesn't work without Brenda, and I'm the reason she's gone. And I'm the reason everybody thinks she's a joke. Okay, I think you're being a little too hard on yourself. She made her choices. You made yours. It's fine. You can lose a forest. (laughs) Okay, you can't lose a forest. Never mind. Look, it's going to work out, Bia. It is. It's. That's the whole thing about Good Friday. He got over it. A ringing endorsement of the most sacred mysteries of Christianity. Oh, God. I'm kidding. I'm just saying, darkest before the dawn, you know? It's been a year. You know, a whole year. If she didn't hate me, she'd be back. (laughs) Okay, I, I don't think that's true. You didn't hear her on that phone call. 
Okay, maybe so, but I take her at her word. She doesn't want this anymore. And you do, right? Yeah? Great. From the top. Okay, 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 <clears throat> okay, 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 holy crap. Okay, we're in the middle of... Yeah, I can't wait. Just big, just big, 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 big. I'll say Dana's name, okay? I'll just no, say No, I know, we know where Brenda is. Where? Well, that's the thing. Hey everyone, it's Emily Vanderwerf again, and I want to tell you about a way you can raise money to make the world a better place by using the internet. And this is not the way you think. If you are like me, you have several dozen browser tabs open at any given time. I have like hundreds open across the two computers I use, my personal and my work computer. And every time I open a new tab, I could be raising money for great causes. That's thanks to Tab for a Cause. Tab for a Cause is a browser extension and it lets you raise money for charity while you're doing your thing online. While you're opening a new tab to look at the spark notes for Hamlet to see what we ripped off this week, or when you're opening a new tab to check your email, or when you're opening a new tab to check the Arden website for when our next episode's gonna drop, which I hope you do every day several times you can donate a little money to charity. Here's how it works. So every time you open one of those tabs, you're gonna see a beautiful photo and a small ad. The photos are gorgeous, the ads are non-obtrusive. But part of that ad money goes toward a charity of your choice. Those charities include everything from global health initiatives to feeding the hungry to social justice causes. You can find something that will fit your particular desire to do good in the world. So join Team Arden at Tab for a Cause by signing up at tabforacause.org slash Arden. That's tabforacause.org slash Arden, A-R-D-E-N. If you found the show, you probably know how to spell that, but I'm going to spell it for you anyway. Again, tabforacause.org slash Arden. Let's make the world a better place by using the internet. Tell Miss Capson says she's done. Hey, Julie. I have to admit, I thought it would be Bia. You gotta keep them guessing. What do you want? You trying to write a book? I'm about 20 pages into a novel. The setting. Far future Chicago. And in the time of the Mothman, the bug zapper is king. Not that kind of book. A book about me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes more sense. It's very on-brand for you to burn precious seconds of your time answering questions you don't need to dignify. I like the hard-boiled thing you got going on. I do. Everybody quakes in the prison yard when they see me coming. (laughs) This is what, month eight? Thanks for that. No problem. And Ralph and the kid? Safe outside. He took community service. A sweetheart deal. One by my father. Ah. Yes. Ah. Look, I just wanted to come and say... If you want forgiveness, you're not going to get it. I accept you are both doing your jobs. But I don't have to be okay with it. But fans of the show took up donations to get me a sweet commissary fund. So thank you, indirectly, for the ramen. You're welcome. I think the whole thing got away from us a little bit, and by the time we knew you were really alive, we were looking right at you. What are you doing here? Really? I don't know. I guess... So I kind of disappeared from my life? Right. Your one move. Huh? I listened to season one. Every time you screw up a case, you run away. It's what you do, apparently. Run. Did you... Did you like the show? Objectively speaking, it was perfectly fine. Well, you got me there. And my one move is running away. Takes one to know one. It does. Damn. You're too good at this. Oh. You don't want forgiveness. You want advice. And you think that... (laughs) Well, shit. Okay. Here's my advice. I ran away. And it worked. It worked 
really well. But that's because I had something to run to. And you don't. Not yet. When you find that, you'll know. You seem like a cool kid, Julie. (laughs) Sure. That's what I was going for. You thinking I'm a cool kid. I just... I don't know if I can do it again. Do it again? I've heard they're doing another season. Another season of Arden? Yeah. I guess there's a family angle this time. And I know I should get involved. (laughs) What's Bia without me, right? But I just don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Because the first season worked out so well for everyone. That's time, ladies. You two? Solving crime? Good luck to whoever's lives are going to ruin... Okay. Well, son of a gun. Fancy meeting you here. Hey, Brenda. Hey, Bea. Shortly before Easter in 2011, a Montana rancher stepped into a grain bin to fix a mechanical error. He wouldn't step out again. The local police ruled it an accident, but his daughter has spent the last eight lonely, quixotic years trying to prove that he was murdered. So was this the perfect murder? And what does Dan Hamill's death tell us about the decline of the American small town and the American dream? Join us, won't you, as we unravel this mystery on Arden. Arden Season 2, Episode 1, To Bea or Not To Bea, was written by Christopher Dole, Sarah Golub, and Emily Vanderwerf and it was directed by Sarah Golub. Our recording engineer was Ernesto Hurtado, and the episode was recorded at the Rebel Talk Network Studios in Los Angeles. It was edited by Christopher Dole. Our composer is Christopher Hatfield. Arden stars... Michelle Agresti, Tracy Syed, Shannon Estabrook, Charlita Gaston, Benjamin Watts, Mia Drake, Libby Woodbridge, This week's guest stars are Lindsay Zana, Jennifer Leo, Mike Bash, Tal Manier, Daniel Mills, Grant Patrizio, Adam Emperor, Emma Sherjarko, Michaela Swee. This episode featured the song Love, Ire, and Spite by Love Underwater. Download this song and others by the band on Bandcamp. You will believe someone can rock out on a harp. Arden was created and executive produced by Emily Vanderwerf, Christopher Dole, and Sarah Gollin. Our co-executive producers are Chad Ellis, Libby Hill, and Ernesto Hurtado. Our logo is by Dylan Farr. This series is produced in Los Angeles County on the ancestral lands of the Tongva, Tataviam, and Shumash. Our website is ardenpodcast.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. Do you like this show? Do you want to help us make more of it? There are so many ways you can do that. The quickest and easiest way is to toss us a few dollars on Patreon. You'll get access to the first half of Season 2, behind-the-scenes material, and episodic commentary. You can also, for a limited time only, still support us on Indiegogo, where we have a number of attractive perks available. You can buy special Arden-related merchandise on TeePublic, including a very festive Skunk Ape t-shirt. You can rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you found it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and other platforms. But no matter what, we appreciate your earballs, gentle listeners. As always, our location scout was Michelle Agresti, who said, And I hated it. Join us next time for more adventures in Arden. Thank you, and good night.
This week and every week, we'd like to thank our executive producer donors, Amy Tate, Danny Bell, and DJ Sutherland, who are more than just good people. They're the best. This week, we'd like to thank our Indiegogo backers, Abigail Mills, Adelaide Reek, Adrian Vigil, Aspiano, Alan Dahan, Alex Chudzik, Alex Koppel, Alex Talanda, Alex Welch, Alfonso Magana, Alice Tobin, Amalia Lavare, Amanda, and Amy Giacomucci, who all know exactly how to celebrate Grood Fly Day. This week's episode of Arden is brought to you by Tab for a Cause, a way to raise money for charity by opening new browser tabs, and by Next Stop, a new audio sitcom from Multitude.